Okay, uh, we have a lot of territory to cover uh, today. And so we are going to head and move along. Oh, we're going to look briefly at 2 Thessalonians. The authorship of 2 Thessalonians is disputed. And this is the main question of introduction of 2 Thessalonians. So 2 Thessalonians is not in the left column of our, of our chart. It's in the middle column. It's disputed. And uh, uh, it would be the least disputed of those in the middle column, uh, the three, Ephesians, Colossians, and 2 Thessalonians. The argument against Pauline authorship is primarily that the eschatology of 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians are incompatible, but that is far from convincing. Excuse me. The book in style and vocabulary is thoroughly Pauline, and even scholars as liberal as Kummel hold to its authenticity. The occasion, place, and date Paul wrote 2 Thessalonians from Corinth shortly after writing 1 Thessalonians. Uh, the intervening time there is when he sent the letter up to Macedonia, to Thessalonica, and then received word back. So it wasn't a really long time. Again, the date is 50 to 51, like 1 Thessalonians. The purpose Paul's primary purpose was to stem an eschatological fanaticism in the church. In 1 and 2 Thessalonians, Paul speaks a lot about eschatology. In 2 Thessalonians, he corrects their idea that Jesus was going to come back immediately so they could quit their jobs and sit around and live off other people until Jesus came back. Paul says no. It reminds me of when I was a youth pastor. I had a, a young kid in my youth group whose parents didn't attend church. And his mother said to me, would you tell my son to clean up his room? When I tell him to clean it up, he says, hey, Jesus is coming back. It doesn't matter. So please tell him to clean up his room. Well, you know, that's like these people here. Jesus is coming back. I can quit my job. I can live off other people. Uh, I can have a good time. Paul says, Paul says no. Uh, some things have to happen. Uh, the uh, man of lawlessness needs to arise. Now, I'm not going to read all of the passage uh, concerning the man of lawlessness. It's chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. But he says that this man, who uh, we could identify it with the the beast of Revelation, or the Antichrist, uh, he's going to set himself up in opposition to God. And in verses 6 and 7, Paul says, and now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who holds it back will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. He says, you know what is holding him back. Well, Paul, no, we don't know. And what is holding this uh, man of lawlessness back uh, is debated. Some people say it's the Holy Spirit that's at work. Uh, other people say it's the mission to the Gentiles. Jesus said, and this gospel of the kingdom must be preached in all the world, uh, and then the end will come. Well, it hasn't gone there, and so uh, the timetable isn't, isn't happening. Other people say the Roman Empire, emperor, uh, he was a force of maintaining law and order. The bottom line is, uh, we don't really know what this force is that is keeping this man and spirit of lawlessness back. But Paul says he will be revealed and then Christ will return. The outline, a very simple outline, uh, there's a letter opening and closing. Uh, there's an answer to eschatological confusion. Uh, 
in uh, 2, 1 to 17, and then problems that have arisen from eschatological confusion in 3, 1 to 16. And that is all that we will cover on 2 Thessalonians. Do you have questions or comments here? Sir, let me ask a question regarding uh, the man of lawlessness. Yes. Uh, is, is the passage in Second Thessalonians in the man of lawlessness one of our, I, I wouldn't say proof text, but evidence that supports our belief in premillennialism of uh, the Assemblies of God? Uh, well, are, are you thinking pre-trib? Pre, sorry, sorry. Pre-trib, 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 pre-trib Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't think that you can really base it on this passage. Oh, okay. Uh, there may be other passages. Mm. Um, and I imagine those who are not pre-trib would uh, read this passage, you know, and, and maybe use it as a, a proof text. Yeah, that is a, you know, a really debated thing right now in, in eschatology. Yes, Will sir. Christ come back before, in the middle of, or after? The tribulation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Any other questions, comments here on Second Thessalonians? All right, then let us go on. Okay, I don't see the one I need here. Okay, hold on just a second. Okay, I think we've got it now. Okay, we are going to the pastoral epistles. Which are the pastoral epistles? Who can tell me what the pastoral epistles are? Titus for pastors. Okay. Titus and Timothy. Okay, okay. First and second Timothy and Titus are the pastoral epistles. Uh, We'll give an overview of the introductory matters. We're gonna go very uh, quickly here. The name pastoral epistles uh, is from Bardot in 1703 in reference to Titus. And then uh, Paul Anton in 1726 popularized the usage The traditional position on the introductory matters of the pastorals is that it was written by Paul. They were written by Paul. Uh, The epistles are complete units. They are not composites. The occasion is Timothy's and Titus' need for uh, advice in handling church problems. The date, 1 Timothy and Titus, around 63. 2 Timothy, around 67. The place for 1 Timothy and Titus, the Eastern Mediterranean area, and uh, for 2 Timothy, it would be uh, Rome during the second imprisonment. All right. Um, That 
that is an overview of the traditional position uh, on the pastoral epistles. I personally hold to the traditional position. Uh, we're going to look at authorship, and this is going to determine a lot of the questions about introduction. Uh, the traditional view uh, is that it was written by Paul. In terms of internal evidence, uh, does it bear the marks of coming from the same apostle who wrote the other epistles? Well, John Stott says the internal evidence is plain and so comprehensive that the theory of pseudonymity would credit Paul's imitator with historical and literary genius. Uh, to me, it seems that the internal evidence is uh, clearly Pauline. The external evidence, the pastors were, pastorals were universally accepted as genuine from the beginning, going all the way back to Clement of Rome in AD 96 and on through the church fathers. I'm not going to detail those, uh, but it was seen as authentically by Paul. They were accepted as genuine without exception until the 19th century when Friedrich Schleiermacher uh, began the questioning of the authorship. It has been accepted since Schleiermacher that the pastorals were not written by Paul. That's the typical liberal position, and it's like a knee-jerk reaction. You know, when you go to the doctor and he hits your knee and, and your, your leg pops up, that's the way it is with, with this, with scholarship. Pastoral epistles, non-Pauline. Pastoral epistles, non-Pauline. Don't even think about it, non-Pauline. Um, William Mounts here says, Gordon's fee common, Gordon Fee's commentary is a trumpet call to scholarship to reevaluate the conclusions that have been held so tightly for some time. We should have two preliminary observations. Even though it's not unanimous, most scholars recognize that all three of the pastoral epistles came from the same author, whoever wrote them. And secondly, the real issue here is not the text. It is rather one's presuppositions about the text. We're going to look at arguments against Pauline authorship uh, very briefly. First of all, historical circumstances. And this argument says there is no place in Acts where the pastorals could fit in. So you look at Acts, how could this have happened in the book of Acts? Well, we can't find a place. But a response to that is that Paul was released from prison after Acts was finished, had a further ministry, went to Spain, went back to the Eastern Mediterranean area, ministered with Titus and Timothy, uh, wrote Titus in 1 Timothy, was re-arrested, taken back to Rome, and wrote 2 Timothy at that point. So it would be like this that we looked at the other day. A fourth missionary journey could very well have happened, even though it's not recorded in Acts. Uh, and here is some evidence. First Clement says that Paul reached the furthest limits of the West. Where would that be? Well, it would be Spain. Um, and here we have uh, the Muratorian Canon, the departure of Paul from the city of Rome uh, when he journeyed to Spain, to Spain, okay? Um, Again, more very early evidence. And also from Eusebius that Paul came a second time to Rome and suffered martyrdom under Nero. So there is evidence that um, we have a historical setting for the pastorals. Secondly, the way the pastorals deal with problems in the churches. The argument is that 
In other letters, Paul argues against false teaching, but here he warns against it. But in response, that is what you would expect in writing to his own representative. He is writing to Timothy. He's writing to Titus, people who he has placed there. He doesn't have to argue with them about the false teaching. He just has to make sure that they uh, understand how, um, how serious this false teaching is. Thirdly, the false teaching itself. The argument is that the heresies described in the pastorals were not in existence in Paul's lifetime. It says that there's uh, traces of Gnosticism that Paul is fighting there. Gnosticism didn't become a fully developed heresy until the second century, so it would have had to have been written in the second century. In response, there was a similar heresy in Colossae during Paul's lifetime. Uh, there was also something like that in 1 Corinthians, we see, also in 1 John. Uh, the Gnosticism here is in the beginning stages. Everything that went into full developed Gnosticism was already present during Paul's lifetime. Next, the organization of the church. It is argued that the organization of the church in the pastorals is too advanced for Paul's day. You know, he talks about elders and overseers, bishops, and uh, that Paul didn't have those in his day. But in response, the churches of Paul's day had the offices found in the pastorals. We are told that he uh, appointed elders in the churches on his second missionary journey. He, uh, in writing Philippians, which nobody doubts that Paul wrote that, it's addressed to the overseers, the bishops uh, in the church in Philippi. So those offices were present during Paul's lifetime. Next, the theology of the pastoral epistles. The argument, the theology of the pastoral epistles is different from Paul's other letters. There are themes that often appear in Paul's other letters that don't appear in the pastorals. There are themes that appear in the pastorals that don't appear in Paul's other letters. So on the basis of that, some people have said, well, this didn't really come from Paul. Uh, but that position is overstated. It is a difference of emphasis. Paul doesn't have to mention everything he believes in every letter he writes. Now, we all know how central the cross is to Paul's theology. Could you imagine Paul writing a letter and not mentioning the cross? Well, Paul never mentions the cross in Romans, Paul's greatest theological letter. Uh, so this kind of reasoning doesn't always work. Uh, he doesn't have to mention everything that he believes in every letter, and he can mention, mention things that are unique in one letter and not in the others. And then the vocabulary of the pastoral epistles. The argument is that Paul could not have written the pastorals because the vocabulary and stylistic differences are too great. But in response, the methodology of this argument is flawed. Uh, there was a... Uh, a scholar by the name of P.N. Harrison, who wrote a book entitled The Problem of the Pastoral Epistles. And in it, he did a detailed study on the vocabulary and style. And he concluded that Paul could not have written because the style was too different. Bruce Metzger says, it seems therefore that a discreet reticence, hesitancy, should replace the almost unbounded confidence with which many scholars have used this method 
in attempting to solve the problem of the authorship of the pastoral epistles. So these are the arguments against Pauline authorship. I think we can answer every one of those very well. And um, it's also a good thing that this, this whole area is being rethought by scholars today. It is not so much uh, the, uh, the knee-jerk reaction anymore that Paul couldn't have written the pastorals. Well, then what did they say did happen? How did these letters come to being? So we're going to look at two theories. One is that of pseudonymity, that someone else wrote the pastorals in the name of Paul. I. Howard Marshall says, the reigning hypothesis is that the letters were written much later than Paul by some unknown person who was using Paul's authority to say what he believed the church of his day needed to know. So the idea then is that at a later time, someone wrote saying that it was Paul when it really wasn't, but he wanted to address issues of his day. We call this pseudonymity, writing in the name of someone else. But let's ask some questions. If the pastoral's epistles were written by someone other than Paul, who wasn't really trying to make uh, people think that Paul was writing them, then why does he include personal references as if it really was from Paul? See, the idea is that pseudonymity was just a common way of writing in Paul's day, that you would write in the name of a famous person. Everybody knew it wasn't from the famous person, so there was no attempt to deceive, but uh, you know they just sort of winked and accepted it. So it wasn't an attempt to deceive. It wasn't a forgery. But if, in fact, Paul or whoever wrote it, puts in personal details, like bring the cloak that I left uh, with Carpus in Troas, bring the uh, parchments, bring the books, the scrolls, things like this that make it seem like whoever is writing it really wants us to think that it was by Paul. There is no evidence that the Christian community ever accepted a book that was knowingly pseudonymous. It was condemned, it was exposed, and the person who did it was ejected. What is the, the good of writing pseudonymously if you don't deceive people into thinking it was really written by Paul. What good is it? Well, probably no good. And uh, so we would come to the conclusion that if it was not written by Paul, it was written to deceive, and that it was not simply a practice that was accepted by the church, but it was something frowned upon by the church and never uh, condoned by the church. Secondly, we have the fragment theory, that the pastorals incorporate genuine fragments written by Paul. Um, Harrison says that there were five fragments, and I, we won't read these, but I'll just give them to you here. Titus 3, 12 to 15 is the first one. 2 Timothy 4, 13 to 15, and 20 to 21a is the second. The third is 2 Timothy 4, 16 to 18a. Uh, and then we have 2 Timothy 4, 9 to 12 and 22b. And then the last one is uh, several different passages from uh, 2 Timothy. 
There are a few problems with this theory, though. The writing style of the fragments is the same style as that of the rest of the letters. How did the editor get these unknown fragments? They had to have been unknown because if people knew about them and they saw them here, they would say, hey, we know where this is from. This is, wasn't uh, a new writ writing by Paul. He wrote that years ago. Where did the editor get these fragments? Why did he put them in this order? And maybe the strongest argument here is why three epistles? If the reason for the pastoral epistles was to use these fragments of genuine Pauline writing, why was 1 Timothy written? There are no fragments in 1 Timothy. It makes no sense. And um, so we would just have to conclude that this theory is too fragmented to be accepted. Besides that, we saw a very early use by the church of these letters. Then what is the answer to the issue of authorship in the pastoral epistles? A possible solution, could the differences be because of a different amanuensis or secretary? Could it be that Paul used a different secretary here than he normally did? Um, now, Paul was writing under different circumstances. When he wrote the prison epistles, he was under house arrest. But when he writes 2 Timothy, he is arrested. He is in prison. Um, so it could very well be that the difference in secretaries could make a difference in the wording and the way things are said in the pastoral epistles. Could Luke be that amanuensis. So it's been speculated that it was Luke. Luke was with Paul at the time. Um, especially there are some people who see they see a parallel between Luke, the gospel, and the pastoral epistles. Also, throughout the pastoral epistles, we have medical terminology. Remember that Luke was a physician. We have medical terminology throughout the pastoral epistles. Uh, when he speaks of uh, sound teaching, that word sound is the word healthy. He talks about healthy teaching, unhealthy teaching. He mentions gangrene, a kind of infection medical terminology. He talks about friction, like you would have in your shoe when you get a new pair of shoes and it rubs a blister. Medical terminology. Could it be that Luke was Paul's secretary for the pastoral epistles? Well, the bottom line, on the basis of the evidence, we can conclude that the pastoral epistles were written by Paul as they claim. Okay, uh, questions or comments here? I realize that we have, you know, we've flown over this at 30,000 feet, but uh, do you have any questions or comments? If not, we will go on. looks like the inspiration of the Holy Spirit has been kicked out of all these arguments. The inspiration of the Holy Spirit? On the writing. Uh, well, um, now we believe that the Holy Spirit inspired the writing. The Holy Spirit superintended the whole process the whole process of uh, inspiration 
from when Paul dictated it to the time that it was written down, that was all under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Oh, I forgot to enlarge it. Okay, I'm going to have to pull off on that for a minute. There's got to be a better way of doing this. Okay. All right. We will go to Hebrews. Hebrews is a very wonderful book and also a very mysterious book. There is a lot that we don't know about the book of Hebrews. The first question that we're going to ask is that of the recipients. Who was the letter written to? Well, the consensus is that it was written to Jewish Christians. The title Pros Ebraios to the Hebrews uh, appears on all the ancient uh, manuscripts here of Hebrews. Now, a Hebrew can refer to a Jew, or it can refer specifically to a Hebrew-speaking Palestinian Jew. Now, I think it's we can be pretty certain that these were not Hebrew-speaking Palestinian Jews, but they were Jews probably of the diaspora, some other place in the Roman Empire. Uh, they were Jews who had become Christians, so they were uh, Messianic Jews. Uh, they were members of a specific Christian community. The following verses show that the author is writing to a specific community. Uh, it, just, it shows that he knows about them. We have much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you because you, are no, long, you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. See, the writer is, is uh, very knowledgeable about them. Remember those earlier days after you had received the light when you endured in a great conflict full of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. So the author knows these people. It's a specific group. Uh, he presupposes a detailed knowledge of the Old Testament, of Jewish practices. Uh, these people were tempted to go back to the synagogue, to give up their faith in Christ. And the author is passionate for them not to do that to hold on, to keep on keeping on. They had some kind of relationship with the author. 
He says, I particularly urge you to pray so that we may be restored to you soon. There is also the possibility that they form part of a larger Christian community. He said, greet all your leaders and all God's people. We know that much about the recipients. What about the destination? What location was the letter sent to? Well, the answer is, we don't know. And we're going to hear this a lot about this book. The only geographical reference that might indicate something is that he says, those from Italy send you greetings. But he could be in Italy, writing anywhere in the Roman Empire, sending greetings from those in Italy. Or he could be away from Italy, writing to Italy with some people who were from Italy, and they sent the greetings. So uh, we don't know. Speculations about the destination, Bruce, Hagner, Lane, and Ellingworth all say it's Rome. Hughes says Palestine. Moffat says it was not Rome or Alexandria. Uh, Montefiore says Corinth. Linders says somewhere in the Mediterranean area. So you can't get much more general than that. It could be Rome. It could be Corinth. It could be Judea. It could be uh, one of many places. I personally believe that it's Rome, that this group of people are a house church in Rome. The date, when was the letter written? Uh, well, there are two kinds of evidence here. The external evidence, Hebrews is quoted by Clement of Rome in AD 95. It's very early. Internal evidence, Timothy is mentioned in 1323. Um, the readers had heard the gospel from those who had heard the Lord in 2.3. So uh, there are no more than one generation after the apostles. A period of time had elapsed since they became Christians. You know, he tells them, think back about the persecution that you went through. So the Hebrews had not resisted to the point of shedding their blood. And here, I, here we have that uh, passage again about remembering the suffering that they went through. And they have not resisted to the point of shedding their blood. In the first century, there were three Roman persecutions. There was one under Claudius in AD 49. There was one under Nero in AD 64. And there was one under Domitian in the 80s and 90s. So we have these three. Where does this letter fall uh, among these three? The persecution under Claudius was rather minor and resulted in the Jews being expelled from Rome. That persecution seems to fit the one described in 1032 to 33. Okay. The persecution under uh, Nero in AD 64 resulted in the loss of many lives, including that of Paul and Peter. Therefore, it would seem that Hebrews would have had to have been written prior to AD 64, because in 124, the writer says, in your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. So if the book was written between the persecutions by Claudius and Nero, it would be between the dates of AD 49 and AD 64. There is no mention of the destruction of the temple. Now, it would seem incredible looking at Hebrew's argument that if the temple had been destroyed, that he would not have mentioned it. It would, it would be the clinching argument. Uh, Donald Hagner says, it is highly remarkable, indeed unbelievable, that had our author written after the destruction of the temple, he could have failed to mention it. 
for this historical fact could have been seen as the divine authentication of the author's central argument that the Levitical ritual was outmoded and hence without significance. And we also have a, uh, a quote from Luke Timothy Johnson, which I'm not going to take time to read. Speculations about the date uh, going all the way from 52 as late as 90. Uh, those later dates are unrealistic. And uh, I would say probably it was written in the early 60s. Somewhere around the time of Paul's prison epistles. The author who wrote the letter. Now, usually we ask the question, was the letter written by the person it, it uh, claims to have been written by? But it's anonymous. It doesn't claim to have been written by anybody. So we have to ask who wrote it. Between 200 and 1500 most held to Pauline authorship. Um, there is no consensus among scholars as to who wrote Hebrews. Uh, Clement of Alexandria, or Origen, Origen rather, said the thoughts of the are the apostles, that is Paul's, but the style and composition belong to one who called to mind the apostles' teaching, and as it were, made short notes of what his master said. If any church, therefore, holds this epistle as Paul's, let it be commended. For without reason uh, have those of old handed it down, for not without reason, have those of old handed it down as Paul's. But who wrote the epistle? In truth, God knows. And that is our, <laughs> uh, that is where we are today. God knows. Uh, the book was uh, accepted early on by part of the church. Uh, it was later accepted by uh, eventually all the church as being canonical. So it was held as uh, part of the canon from the earliest days all the way until the Reformation. It was Luther and Calvin who rejected its Pauline authorship. And today, virtually no scholar of any stature that I know of believes that Hebrews was written by Paul. We can say fairly confidently that he didn't write it for these reasons. Hebrews is anonymous, and Paul never writes an anonymous letter. The author of Hebrews claims to have gotten his gospel secondhand from those who heard Christ. Paul claims direct revelation from Christ. The elegant style of writing is clearly a different style uh, from that of Rome, uh, from that of Paul. And the theology of Hebrews has emphases that Paul doesn't have. The way the author cites scripture is different from Paul's method. Now, Luke Timothy Johnson believes that Paul uses a Platonic worldview, uses Platonic terminology. I think he, he uses Platonic terminology, but he's not a Platonist. If Paul didn't write Hebrews, then who did? What are the possibilities? Well, some say Luke. Some say Clement of Rome. Um, Barnabas, Silvanus or Silence, Silas, uh, Philip the deacon, Epaphras. Priscilla, the Virgin Mary, 
Peter, Jude, Stephen, Aristion. Uh, these are all guesses as to who may have written it. Uh, but today, the, the uh, one that is believed most to have written it would be Apollos. Uh, Luther believed it was Apollos. Now, it probably wasn't a woman, because in 1132, the author describes himself with a masculine participle, which would seem to eliminate uh, a woman author. If you look at the description of Apollos in Acts 18, and then you compare it to what we have in Hebrews, uh, it can, uh, we can see some parallels. Montefiore has given, I think, 12 different pieces of evidence that Apollos wrote it. And I'm not gonna go into all of this. Uh, you can get it from the PowerPoint, but all of these things really sound like, well, maybe Apollos could have written it, uh, they really sound like Apollos, but in fact, did, did he write it? Um, all of this evidence really is not conclusive. It is speculation. What we need to realize is that this is speculation. It is a guess, a shot in the dark. All the clues may be no more than someone's forcing a conclusion on evidence that is really not conclusive. Uh, let me give you an example. Back in, it's probably 1969, uh, some of you have heard the, of the musical group, the Beatles, a uh, quartet of singers, and they were, they were extremely popular throughout the world. Well, a rumor arose that one of their singers, Paul McCartney, was dead. And I watched a television uh, special about this. And for, I don't know if it was a half an hour or an hour, they gave one bit of evidence after the other that Paul McCartney was dead. They went through the, the albums, the pictures on the album covers to show all of this. They played the music. They played some of the music backwards. And you could hear, uh, hear them saying, Paul is dead, miss him, miss him. Just one thing after another. By the time the program is over, you're convinced Paul McCartney is dead. But there was one problem. He wasn't dead. And all of this evidence that they marshaled up here to show that he was, uh, was really valueless because he was very much alive. Well, you know, the same thing could be happening here with all this evidence on Apollos. And I think that uh, there are some scholars, New Testament scholars today that need to consider Paul McCartney. You know, he really is alive and all of your quote evidence really doesn't, doesn't hold together. So where does that leave us? The bottom line was said by Origen in the third century, but who wrote this epistle? In truth, God knows, and only God knows. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, does it belong in the canon if it wasn't written by Paul? I would say yes. I mean, it has all the marks of inspiration. And, you know, maybe, maybe God fooled us because he wanted this in the canon. Maybe he fooled the church to think that it was written by Paul. But uh, it certainly has the marks of inspiration, okay? Uh, do you have questions or comments here on the authorship of Hebrews? Uh, yes, I, I couldn't help wondering why the author what, would want to hide their identity except that this was during the time uh, between Her Nero and Domitian, so could they be after witnessing the martyrdom of Paul and Peter, could they be trying to protect the, their identity? 
Well, I actually believe that it was written between Claudius and Nero. Uh, the, the people there had not yet shed their blood, and they certainly would have under Nero. But it could very well be that they saw what was coming. And it, it could be that the people that he's writing to saw what was coming, and they didn't want to go through that again. Only this time it was going to be worse. And so he says, stay in there. Don't turn back. Keep on keeping on. You know, look to Jesus, the author and finisher of the faith. You know, he kept on in spite of the, uh, the cross. He looked beyond that to the joy that lay before him. You stay in there too. Don't give up. So I think it's that's the, yeah. Rather than looking back Those... to what has happened, mm -hmm. they're looking forward to what may happen. And yet they sound insurrectionist by saying those things. Uh, I don't know what you mean there. Like I, they could have been uh, charged with trying to start a revolt, a, um, an insurrection against the emperor. Couldn't they have been mis uh, uh, seen as such? You know, I don't think that they would have been seen like that. Um, but what they did, what came to light was that Christianity was no, not a, a, uh, sect of Judaism. It was not just an, uh, a Jew, Jewish offshoot, but it was really something different. When that was realized, then persecution came. Uh, the Christians didn't revolt. You know, they were they were positive toward the Roman emperor, I believe. Now that's debatable perhaps, but I believe they, that they were positive toward the Roman government and they did not form uh, an insurrection, but uh, it was illegal to be a Christian at that time. Sir. Yes. Just a comment. Uh, All right. It's very good to see that when you read the Hebrews, it's very it's theology is very powerful and it's very inspired. Uh, it has great chapters like Hebrews 12, no statements like uh, Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is saying yesterday, today, and forever. Although it's anonymous, and yet when you read it, you could not put it into the same category as the New Testament apoc apocryphal books or the Gnostic books, mm -hmm. even though it's anonymous, it's very different, very much like a canonical writing like Paul's. That's right. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's internal evidence says that it's inspired. <laughs> it bears all the marks of inspiration. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let us uh, take a 10-minute break, and we will come back. I'll tell you what, can we take a five-minute break this time? Five minutes? Okay, let's do that. All right. Here in First Peter, there was supposedly a worldwide Roman persecution of Christians that First Peter is addressing. That is said by those who doubt the authorship of First Peter. But in rebuttal, the persecution of 1 Peter was undoubtedly spontaneous persecutions by individuals. There is no evidence of an official governmental persecution in this book. And the second argument uh, that we're going to mention is the Greek, it is said, is too good for a Galilean fisherman. Well, that's very much like was said about James. The rebuttal, even in Galilee, Greek was spoken. It's possible that Sylvanus had a significant role in the wording of the letter. Uh, if so, that could account for the good Greek. And uh, 
just like, you know, if some of you are not native English speakers, you may want to get a native English speaker to uh, revise something that you write. Well, so would Peter. And that is probably what he did. In terms of unity, integrity, the only major argument that First Peter is composed of two documents is that some passages seem to speak to a case of potential persecution, and some seem to speak to a case of actual persecution. For example, in 314, Peter says, but rather if you should suffer because of righteousness, you are blessed. The verb you should suffer, uh, pascoite, is in the optative mood, which is used for conditions that are very much not expected to happen. But in other places, it is obvious that persecution is in fact already happening. But if the situation is one of spontaneous persecution by individuals, it could not be assumed that everyone who receives the letter is being persecuted. But those who are, are being addressed at times, acknowledging the fact of their present persecution. So the situation to which Peter is writing is mixed. Some are being persecuted and others are not, even though there is a chance that they will be and so all need to hear Peter's exhortation about endurance in suffering. The occasion, uh, the persecution of potent or potent potential persecution of his readers for the sake of Christ. So he's telling them to stand boldly for Christ be countercultural if they must. Uh, a lot of this persecution would come from people who uh, persecute them because they are not worshiping the gods. And if bad things happen, it's because the gods are angry and are striking out at them. Whereas if these Christians had only offered sacrifices, we wouldn't be going through this problem. You know, that kind of thinking. So uh, there is this possibility of persecution that uh, Peter is writing about. The purpose is given in 512, to encourage or comfort and to testify to God's grace. It was to encourage endurance for those who were facing the prospect or the actual are actually undergoing persecution. The place in 513, the place is given as Babylon. Certainly, it wasn't Babylon of the Middle East. It is without a doubt Rome, where Peter was later martyred. The date is li uh, likely shortly before Peter's death in the early 60s. Uh, the outline, a simple organization of 1 Peter cannot be given, says Kummel. Generally, First uh, Peter is divided into three parts. 1.3 to 2.10, here we have the people of God. 2.11 to 4.11, living together as God's household. And then 4.12 to 5.11, uh, vigilance in persecution. Okay, uh, I'm not going to take time to read key verses from 1 Peter. You can get the what I believe are key verses from the PowerPoint. Do you have questions or comments here on 1 Peter? I know we're moving really quickly. All right. If Luke, can I say something? Yes. Uh -huh. if, if Luke was saying in the book of Acts that Peter... And John were unschooled. What's your vision on the uh, authorship? The Peter wrote the, his, his letter. Uh, I don't think there's anything in the letter that would uh, contradict what Luke says. Uh, you wouldn't have to have a PhD to write first Peter. 
And uh, I think that it would be very reasonable that Peter could have written this letter. Okay. All right. Okay. okay. Let us go on then. All right, Second Peter and Jude. First of all, we'll look at Second Peter at authorship. The authenticity of Second Peter is more disputed than any other epistle in the New Testament. Okay? It is more disputed than any other epistle. Uh, Carson and Moo give the reasons for the doubts that, uh, excuse me, it was written by Peter. Arguments against Petrine authorship. The external evidence for the letter is the poorest of any of the books of the New Testament. It was not attested too early and was doubted by some in the third and fourth centuries. Uh, but as Guthrie points out, there is no evidence from any part of the early church that this epistle was ever rejected as spurious in spite of the hesitancy which existed over its reception. So no one ever said that we know of that Peter didn't write this. One factor that is seen as evidence for the late date is the mention of Paul's epistles and the statement that they are scripture in 3, 15, and 16. Uh, however, uh, they presuppose that there was the Pauline corpus had already been uh, formed, but maybe not. Maybe Paul's letters were still being circulated individually and people were familiar with them. and. Peter said that, uh, you know, some people twist these hard sayings that we find in Paul's letters uh, to their own destruction. So uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that there was a uh, formal collection of Pauline corpus at this point. Another factor is the relationship between 2 Peter and Jude. Now, here is a comparison uh, of some similar phrases that appear in both. I'm not going to read the whole passage, uh, just the parts that overlap. Uh, Second Peter, denying the sovereign Lord. Jude, deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Uh, Second Peter 2, 4 to 10, we have angels, we have judgment. Sodom and Gomorrah, example, punishment, and we have all of those in Jude. Keep abuse on celestial beings, angels, blaspheme, they do not understand unreasoning animals, destroyed animals. In Jude, heap abuse on celestial beings, archangel, slander, they do not understand, irrational animals, destroy. Second Peter, blemishes, feast, Balaam, uh, driven by a storm, blackest darkness is reserved for them, in Jude, Balaam, blemishes, feast, blown along by the wind, 
for whom the blackest darkness has been reserved. In the last days, scoffers, desires. In the last times, scoffers, desires. So you can see the parallels here between 2 Peter and Jude. Certainly, there is a relationship between these letters. <clears throat> Generally, it is believed that 2 Peter used Jude in its composition. Then it is asked, would the Apostle Peter have copied parts of another work to include his letter in his letter? Karsten Moo argued that it could be the reverse, that Jude condensed 2 Peter. They could also have used another source. So it could be that um, there was a, another composition that both Jude and Peter uh, used in the composition of their letters. The relationship between 2 Peter and Jude is simply not clear. If Jude used 2 Peter, then that is the earliest attestation and very er early external evidence for 2 Peter. So uh, we have those parallels there between the two. Date and place of 2 Peter, shortly before Peter's death in Rome in the early 60s. The occasion of 2 Peter is the appearance of false teachers who were teaching a heresy that said that God would not intervene in the world to bring judgment, but rather that the world would continue as it is undisturbed. But with God, a thousand years is as a day, isn't it? And vice versa. The purpose throughout the book, Peter gives one rebuttal after another to the heresy of the false teachers. As Actemeyer Green and Thompson point out, 2 Peter shows how close and inseparable theology is with morality, specifically how closely eschatology and ethics are united. So our ethics is determined by our eschatology. He says, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. Secondly, 2 Peter serves as Peter's testament, a legacy left for those of coming generations. In terms of an outline, uh, we have a very simple outline here, besides the opening and the, and the closing doxology. We have a summary of Peter's teaching in uh, 1, 3 to 11. Peter's, quote, testament, the authenticity of the apostolic message and refutation of false teachers, exhortation to, uh, to a life lived in knowledge of the coming eschaton. So very much ethically oriented, uh, very much eschatologically oriented as well. Okay, do you have questions or comments on 2 Peter? All right. Let us go to Jude. Authorship, authenticity. It's quite certain that Jude is the half-brother of Jesus. He identifies himself as the brother of James. James, the leader of the church in Jerusalem, was the half-brother of Jesus and the full brother of Judas, or Jude, as it is translated in, into English. Or you could translate it Judah as well. Richard Baucom says, we should notice that the general character of the letter, its Jewishness, its debt to Palestinian Jewish literature and Haggadic traditions, its apocalyptic perspective and exegetical methods, its concern for ethical practice more than for doctrinal belief, are all entirely consistent with authorship by Jude, the brother of Jesus. So, um, you know, I would ask, if somebody wrote this letter and wanted to put somebody's name on it, why Jude? 
Now, why somebody so obscure? I mean, who of us knows anything about Jude other than the letter? Well, he's mentioned a time or two just by name in the Gospels, but that's all. So it's pretty good evidence that Jude himself wrote it. Its purpose, Jude's appeal to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people uh, in verse 3, and then that's expanded in 20 to 23. But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire to show, uh, to show, uh, to others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. The date would be uh, sometime in the second half of the first century. And here is a, a brief outline of the book. Now, the most famous part of this book, oh, by the way, I also have it by Bauckham, but I'm not going to go into that. The most famous part of the book is the, this great Jude doxology which I used to use as a doxology when I pastored, as a benediction, raise my hand and pronounce this to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. And if I had time, I would play you Billy Sprague's song, Jude Doxology, a really great song taken from this passage. Any questions about Jude? All right. All right. The Johannine epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, we will first of all look at 1st John, uh, the authorship, it seems quite certain that the same person wrote both the gospel of John and the epistles of John. So if you can identify the author of the gospel, you'll identify the author of the epistles. And uh, when we looked at the gospel, we concluded that it was written by John the Apostle. Uh, in terms of external evidence, the evidence for the Johannine epistles comes generally later than that of the gospels. It's quite good for 1 John but 2nd and 3rd John are less well attested, probably because they're so brief and seemingly less important. Uh, the epistles were never attributed to anyone else other than John. Characteristics. 1st John has none of the usual markings of a letter. It seems to have a body of a letter without the typical beginning or end. 
Now, when we saw Hebrews, we saw it had the, be, uh, the end of a letter, but not the beginning of one. First John has neither. All it is uh, is an essay. Date and provenance. Assuming the authorship of the Apostle John, the date would probably be in the 90s. The provenance would probably be Ephesus, with which the Apostle John was associated. Destination. The destination seems to be the churches in the cities in the area of Ephesus. The occasion. Uh, a conflict had arisen in the church, and John writes to answer the particular situation. Heresies had arisen in the church, and the church was being split by those who were leaving. What were the heresies? John tells those in the church to hold to what they had from the beginning. We see several places here where he mentions that which we have from the beginning. You have heard it from the beginning. So he tells them, Go back to what you had at the beginning. All of this new stuff that you're hearing is heresy, and uh, don't follow it. Here, John is referring to the apostolic gospel. The apostolic gospel, not some later reinterpretation, not some Gnostic stuff, but we've got to go back to what the apostles of Jesus Christ taught. That is truth. There were two areas of concern that are evident. One has to do with the Christology of the heretics. Christology forms the yardstick for discerning the spirit of truth. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, he says. And in 4, 2, and 3, this is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge, acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. There was certainly a concern to confess that Jesus had come in the flesh. At the beginning of the letter, John takes great pains to stress that Jesus had a real body. That which was from the beginning, which you have heard which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. He had a real body. It didn't just seem like a body. It was a real body. Uh, Ignatius, the bishop of Antioch, writing in the uh, early second century, describes people called docetus. He says, but if, as some atheists, that is unbelievers, say, he suffered in appearance only, while they exist in appearance only, why am I in chains? And why do I fight the wild beasts? If that is the case, I die for no reason. What is more, I am telling lies about the Lord. For he suffered all these things for our sakes, in order that we might be saved. And he truly suffered just as he truly raised himself, not as certain unbelievers say, that he suffered in appearance only. For if these things were done by our, our Lord in appearance only, then I am in chains in appearance only. Their heresy seemed to involve docetism. So it certainly appears that there were Gnostic characteristics to the heresies, as well as a docetic bent to them. So docetism said Jesus did not have a real body. It only seemed like it was a real body. Docetism is a development of Gnosticism, which says that 
since only the spiritual is good and the material is evil, Jesus could not have had a real body of flesh. He only seemed to have a material body. The word seemed is dokeo in the Greek, from which we get the word docetism. When you look at the great emphasis in 1 John on the fact that Jesus came in the flesh, it seems that the heresy must have said that he didn't. So John is uh, dealing with people who say Jesus didn't really have a body, uh, an incipient Gnosticism. John calls the church back to the apostolic gospel and to obedience to Jesus' command to love God and one another. Notice how closely love for God and love for others is. Those who love God will obey his commands. His chief commandment is love one another. So a direct result of loving God is loving one another. So loving God is obeying God's commands. What is God's command? To love one another. So it is a cycle. We love God. If we love God, we keep his commands. His commandment, his great commandment is love one another. So the heretics had a wrong view of who Jesus was. They also made claims about themselves that no Christian would claim. They claimed to be without sin. John says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. My alarm just went off. What does that mean? It means we need to bring this session to a close. So uh, we will do that now. Let me just give you one more chance to, uh, if you have any questions or comments here. Okay. Thank you all for being a Thank great you, class. And uh, if, if I don't get to say this at the final, thank you, you all. You've just sort of become my family. Uh, I've loved Thank being you, with sir. you. And uh, Thank you, sir. Sir. this is a great group. That was so much fun. Well, thank you. And meaningful, I, meaningful I am day. glad. Thank I am so glad. Much, it has been wonderful for me. So the Lord bless you. So, and, we'll, see you uh, we'll see you on the exam date, sir. That's right. That's right. Uh, you, uh, it'll, it, will be, it will be on Moodle. So um, okay, you will need to go on to Moodle and okay. on to Zoom. And for those of you who are using a second camera, you will need to uh, do that as well. Now, if there are those of you who would like to set up a second camera right now to see if it works, uh, I will stay on and we can see if that works for you. Okay. Sir, sir we're in Moodle. Can we... Oh my God. Uh, it will be. Uh, right along with the other quizzes, they're there. It'll be right there. When you, uh, when you open the, the tables and the, the, the last the last tile, when we open the last, when we yes. open the last. Yeah, where the quizzes were last time, it'll be right with there. the tiles. Is, is it the tile or where, shall, where we open the tile? The tile. The tile. Above, the tile. above the tile. Above the tiles. Above, above all above of the I tiles. I guess above the tiles. Um, yeah. Alvin Don't says above the tiles, outside. and Alvin is oh, always what? right. Uh, no, sir, we, we took a picture of it so that we can see where the quiz is yeah. before. Okay. Yeah. So we can reorient yes, ourselves sir. with where you will put the... Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. We have, a, we have an idea. Um, yes. I guarantee you it will be uh, very and, easy to find. And I guess with us in New Zealand, I think we might have to do the camera as well. Because we right. can't get, oh, I think some people uh, have Here. doctors, but 